Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I want to focus on a topic we haven't covered before and it's more to do with what you do after your training. So this is when you are um, a qualified electrician and you may be a little bit more experienced, you've been um, out in industry for a bit of time and you're wanting to start your own business or work for yourself in any regards. And there's a few ways you can go about doing that. I'm going to explain what some of those are and hopefully give a bit of information that might help one or two of you out who are going through that journey right now. I did it back in 2006, so I was in my mid-twenties, been at it now coming up towards 20 years, running my own little small limited company. And I'm in no way a business guru, just to put that out there straight from the start. I'm just sharing my own experiences, some of the things I've gone through in the hope that it might help one or two others out who are following along. We have spoken about this in other places already. So there's the Electrician Show, which is Neil Bridgman's podcast. There'll be a link in the description to go off and dig into that. We've had some chats around business and how you would set yourself up and some of the things you need to consider in your pricing and other such stuff. And also on my Mark the Sparky Allison YouTube channel, there's a video on there where I break down setting out some of your pricing and what your overheads might be. And again, there'll be a link in the description if you want to go off and watch that one. It just breaks down some of the detail of what we will cover inside this podcast. So I guess the first point to cover off is how are you going to structure your business from the start? So are you going to go down the, the self-employed avenue where you're essentially kind of working under your own name and submitting annual tax returns as such? Or are you going to set up as a limited company? They tend to be the two options. There's other business structures out there, but for people starting out in a trades um, environment, that seems to be the way people would go. I took this limited company route. It just felt an easier way to manage the business day to day, look a bit more professional to clients I was targeting. We'll speak a bit about that later on in the video as well. Um, and also it gives a layer of protection. So when you are a limited company, there are some legal protections to you as an individual that you don't get if you're just setting up as a self-employed person. So you need to set out what works for you. The best place to get that advice is to set out what your business objectives are with an accountant to so go and get that professional expert advice. And again, we'll touch on that later on in this video. But once you've decided how you are going to set up, at least you have that blueprint to build everything out off the top of. Um, so if you're going down the, the limited company route, you then need to be looking at um, things like your banking. So all of the basics that you're going to need to actually operate to be able to receive money, pay your suppliers, you need to get all the fundamentals in place before you even start looking at stuff that's specific to our trade. So you will be looking at setting up a bank account, um, setting up appropriate insurances. And again, they'll be different if you've gone for self-employed or a limited company. So that's insurances in terms of the services you're going to deliver. So your professional indemnity, your product um, liability insurance that you would have out working in a construction space, providing materials, your employer's liability, if you're going to have other work people in and around you, and you will need that to cover for yourself as well. Um, there's other more bespoke insurances that you can have that would cover you in, in sickness. So if you're going to have time off, there's no one else running the business in your absence. So you can have insurance policies in place that look after that. Also contract insurance. So if things go wrong and you're in a contracted way of working with another party there are insurance products available to help you with that as well so it's looking at those basic things just for the business to be able to function so you can legally trade be paid and pay other people so factor in all of that and again an accountant would be the place to go and seek that expert advice and speaking about that it's often very easy to kind of think we can cover off all of this ourselves you know, electricians are among the worst out there for getting upset when people dabble in our trade, but we're quite happy to go off and start um, getting involved in all kinds of other things. But I would say if you don't have a sound understanding of, of how accounts work and how the money side of a business operates to get that expert advice right at the outset, they can help you get your business structure right. They can give you that advice in the best way to set up. So reach out to a local accountancy firm who's got a reasonable reputation and go and speak to them, get that set up. It's a cost and an overhead on your business going forward. So you're going to need that help and support. So if you are going to go down the road of forming a limited company, you would have to do that through company's house. So you need to create the company as a, as a shell. You need to give it a director and a company secretary and set up all of the ownership structure of it and shareholder of it. 
Every year you have to submit a statement to say if anything's changed and how that ownership structure looks and also submit your annual accounts. And again, an accountant is gonna be the best place to get the help and advice for that. So whilst you're forming your business and setting up all of your tax affairs, speak to them about that as well. They'll be able to guide you and help get that set up just how you need. You've also got to factor in the word that we all love and that's tax and dealing with HMRC and that will be different again based if you've gone through self-employed or if you've gone limited company and again those accountants we've mentioned will be really able to, to help you with that but you're going to have to set up to be able to pay yourself so through PAYE if you go in through that, through that mechanism or your annual returns and keeping a set amount of money aside so you know you've got that tax there to pay over at the end of the year when that bill comes in or if you are looking at going VAT registered, so if you're kind of getting involved with the renewable space, VAT is something you're really not gonna be able to avoid. You will soon be at the threshold, so speak to your accountants again. They will be able to forecast what your, you know, your trading volume will be and give you an idea of when VAT is gonna be a likely thing you'll have to go through and the things that you would have to put in place to make that happen. You know, it's not actually a scary thing. VAT registration is quite straightforward. Dealing with HMRC is quite straightforward in terms of registering and getting yourself set up, but it's knowing where to go and do that. And an accountant is the best place to give you that advice. Don't just pretend it's not gonna happen because eventually the tax people will catch up with you and they'll want their money. So get on top of that from the very beginning. It's such an important thing. Lots of people lose their businesses through debts owed to HMRC, so don't be in that position. Keep on top of that right from the very start. So there's also the branding of your business or yourself. So that can be your logo, your business name, um, your marketing efforts. So any adverts you wanna run, having the right logos on it and the right images is a really important thing. So if you've not already created some content around the services you intend to deliver, so the product's been installed, consumer units, light fitting, solar panels, whatever it is, electric vehicle charge points, get some images of it, have a good logo. If you're not able to do that yourself, there are marketing experts out there who can help you with logo design. Fiverr is a great website to use for that. Same with your business name. This is things that I actually struggle with, so it's reaching out to the experts and getting that um, input or friends and family who've got experience in that. You know, you're not looking for a free ride out of those people, but draw on their expertise and hopefully they can help you out in setting up a, a nice logo and marketing catalog of pictures that are gonna help you share what you're offering to the wider world. So once you've got that blueprint and legal entity in place and you've got your bank account, you can start towards looking at, you know, how you're gonna pad this out even further. So there's other things you need to consider as well. There is the basic tools and equipment that you're gonna to need to do the job. So in our specific industry of electricians, you're gonna need a test instrument so you're going to need a multifunction tester. You're going to need all of the ancillaries that go alongside that for your safe isolation. Uh, for other bits of equipment, you might need to help you with fault finding, so clamp meters, all the basic hand tools that you'll need. So in our case, the VDE screwdrivers, croppers, all of the basics to essentially turn up to a job, job and be able to complete it. You are the product in that, that sense. So if you want to sell your services, sell your skills, you need to be able to deliver them and tools and equipment play a part of that. So you need to make sure you've got all of that covered off. Now it could be a case that if you've already been working out in industry as it is, as a subcontractor or um, working alongside other electricians on an agency basis, for example, you may have a good supply of tools, but if not, make sure you've got that factored into your startup costs. You will need to have them. And then there is also transport. So there's getting from A to B. You know, it's not the case that we can pile our, all our stuff in a rucksack generally and run around on the bus. Certainly not when you're running a small limited company yourself and you need to be going to the wholesalers to collect your materials. You've got to get all of your tools that we just mentioned from A to B, go around jobs, do quotes. You're going to need a vehicle, most likely a van. Um, so you need to have a look around at how you're going to set that up. Are you going to look at a lease where you can contract hire a vehicle, for example, over usually three years time, you pay a monthly amount, it's tax deductible and then you can you know offset that against your operating costs or are you going to make a large upfront purchase to reduce your monthly expenditure um, and purchase a vehicle so you could do that and you could go for a, a kind of a, a halfway house between that while you're getting set, set started out and look at the second hand market for a low cost vehicle 
just to get you going. But obviously, again, factoring in the costs of maintaining that. So again, when you go for a contract hire, you can get maintenance packages included. So you're not paying for MOTs, you're not paying for any servicing. You, you know, you've got that set figure, you know what it is, and you can work from that in your business. Whereas if you've got a, a cheaper vehicle you bought second hand, you're then responsible for all the maintenance that might come on it. Um, and sometimes that's a great unknown. It could be a new engine, you might get lucky and there'll be nothing at all. It really is one of those things that you do need to be aware of and mindful as you trade in to build up that buffer to cover against any issues with the vehicle. So you're incorporating risk when you buy in a certain way. So be aware of that. Okay, so if you are gonna work in the domestic sector in particular, you're gonna to need to register with a CPS to notify under part P is the self-assessment style process. So for such things as a rewire, a new consumer unit, a new circuit, you would have to go through the part P process. You could work with a local authority and try and do all of that outside of the CPS system, but it's not low cost and it can be quite difficult to organize. My recommendation would be to look at a CPS provider that is NIPIT and the NIC as the two standout brands in that arena and go and have a look at their website, see what they have to offer and see how that fits in with what you want to do with your business. That's specific to electrical contracting. I know with NIPIT they do cover into other sectors as well, so if you go off and check on their website they get involved in all kinds of things from gas, renewables, um, air conditioning and such. So there are other membership schemes based on what you might be wanting to offer as a business. But focusing in just on the electrical and going through the experience of registering with someone like NAPIT and the NIC, the process is quite similar. You're gonna to need to fill in an application form, which is all your basic information to do with the business that you've set up, it's bank account details, it's trading history. Um, they'll then want to know about you as an individual, so your qualifications, and there has been a change in what those need to be over the last couple of years, so it's worth checking that you are in the right place with that so that you've got your MVQ level three and all of the other little bits and pieces that you need to register with the CPS providers. For example, if you're wanting to be um, a test and inspection provider, you will need to have done your 2391 and have had appropriate experience of doing that as well. You can just register in a, um, an installation capacity separate to inspecting and testing other people's work. So go off and look into that as well. And again, I'll link the NAPIT and NIC websites in the description of this video, so you can go off and, and check those out. Um, once you've gone through the process of filling in the application form, they're gonna to wanna to come out and see you, and that's to go through two or three jobs in the real world that you've completed, for them to have a look at you as an individual, ask some questions while they're there. They generally spend about a day on site, so they'll be looking at your calibration certificates for your test instruments we've spoken about, They'll want to check your insurance documents to make sure that they're all in place. They'll want to see your health and safety policies, your risk assessments, your CPD records, some evidence of invoicing of clients as well. So they want to see all of that in person. And then they'll go out to site and review some jobs that you've done. And typically a change of a consumer unit is a good one, an addition of a new circuit, and then maybe some testing or something. You know, you can be selective in that, so you can choose those and put them forward, they're not gonna come out and randomly select them. So if you've um, done some work for friends and family, you might have had to work with the local authority in doing those jobs, so you can notify them appropriately, and then you can put them forward for your assessment with NAPIT or the, the NIC. And again, when they come to see you, your health and safety documents, if you're only a small company, there's some generic forms on the health and safety executive website, I'll link those in the description as well. It's turning into a linkathon down there, but if you want to go off and look into that, you can. It's a simple page or two for the health and safety policy. You just amend it to sue, and same with the risk assessment. I mean, it is important that you action those things, but the fact you've got a record of them there is, is all you really need. There's going to be a complaints procedure as well, so if you get any customer complaints, how are they um, recorded and um, looked after, same for an accident record, all of the basic things that you would expect from an employee yourself. If you've been out in the workplace, you're going to have to evidence with your CPS provider, they will check that, and your CPD record as well, so that's the latest one we've all got to keep on top of now. Um, it's not just calibration certificates and insurance, they'll want to see a CPD record. They'll also want to see you've got the appropriate publications to hand to help you in your work as an electrician. So you've got an up-to-date version of the wiring regulations. If you're doing test and inspection as well, that you've got your guidance note three, an on-site guide. They want to make sure that you've got everything you need to deliver the job appropriately.
appropriately. Now once you've gone through that process and if it's, if it's come out satisfactory, the um, area engineer who comes out to meet you is happy with you, all of your paperwork and qualifications are in order, they will then provide you with a certificate of compliance through UCAS to say that you are accredited to go and work in domestic dwellings for example. And the assessment process is slightly different if you go in for approved contractor, but again you generally have had to have had the two years or so experience with that. So it's not something you could come straight out of a training environment and apply into. It's like a natural progression of time to work towards that. Um, but again, that's all on their website. You can go and check that out. It's going to be a big part of setting up your electrical business, registering with one or two of those um, setups. And like I say, as time moves along or if you're working in the commercial space, there's also the ECA to look at. And if you've gone with the NIC, their assessment process is just the same. So you don't have to go through it again. I think the ECA except the NIC one. It makes it a smoother process if you're registering with them. There's also the JIB as well. So if you want, you can register with the JIB as an employer, but most likely you're going to be registering with the ECS card scheme. The two are different. So your gold card is something really useful to have if you're going to go out into the subcontract marketplace, especially you'll be able to get onto sites much easier. So if you haven't already, go and look at the JIB ECS website and look into getting your gold card. If you've recently completed your training, you've normally covered off the health and safety aspects required within that. So there shouldn't really be anything else you'd have to do at that point in time. But if three years have lapsed since you've gone through your training, there's the health and safety exam as well, which I think costs 50 or 60 pound. You can do it all online now. Um, and then you can tick the relevant boxes to be able to get your gold card. So go off and do that if you haven't already. So we've got our business structure in place, we've got our bank account, we've covered off the tax liability, we've got our vehicle tools, we're a registered member of a CPS provider. All we need now is some paying customers. And this is where you have to get more proactive. So the other things I'd class as more administration and evidencing of stuff you've already you know, done. This is now where you need to go out into the marketplace and start drawing customers towards you. And there's a few ways you can approach that. Um, there's the online presence that is a, such a big thing these days and also the physical presence in the real world. Um, what I mean by that is the way you would approach your marketing in terms of going for print media, so the local magazines, local newspapers, um, parish council magazines and all the things that you find in the local community that hit people's doormats with an advert in describing your services and what you do. And again, if you speak with those people at those publications, they can generally help you with creating those adverts as well. So it's not from something you're going to have to design yourself. Again, that expert advice. And then the same in the online space. So creating the social media accounts, your Facebook page, an Instagram page, a Twitter account, a LinkedIn profile, all of the things that are going to be suitable to reach your potential client base. Have that online presence. Don't be scared of it. Get yourself out there and create those profiles. So you're going to want to basically start casting yourself into the world. This is us. Ring the number up and get in touch with us and we'll come and do some electrical work for you. It's the basic principle that is underpinning all of your marketing efforts. And it depends on your budget for that of where you want to go. So again, with your, your website, if you've got the budget for it, for it, you could get an expert in to come and help you build that website. But at the outset, if you're trying to keep costs down, there's loads of really helpful website building tools out there now from some of the big domain hosts where you can go off and design your own website. It doesn't have to be a big spiraling beast of hundreds of pages to start with. Just get a physical presence with a few of your core services and the geographical area that you're wanting to cover and get it out there. You know, the SEO side of things is a whole can of worms that if we're all honest, we don't actually fully understand how it works. But the Google rank is important and just creating content and being public about it, joining all of the dots together is the best thing you can do on that front. So if you've created a website, have links to your social media accounts through it and also on your social media accounts have links back to your website and then just keep the content rolling. So create a page, say for example, you're a domestic electrician who wants to specialize in changing consumer units to start with. Create a page explaining how the process of changing a consumer unit works. Mention the geographical area that you'll be changing them in within consistently. And that's kind of building up SEO value of that page. Publish it, leave it out there, and hopefully people will find it in the realms of Google. Working with Google AdWords is something else you can do. So again, if you've got budget, that's where you would pay to rank at the top three or four spaces on a Google search result. You'll see them where it says, 
paid ad at the top of your Google search, you can get in there as well in your local area if you did, say for an electrician in Nottingham or whatever, you could get yourself up there. Again, it's generally worthwhile speaking to marketing experts who look after things like Google Ads campaigns. They can be quite difficult to keep on top of and they're actually quite expensive as well. So it's well worth getting a bit of expert advice if you're sinking three to five hundred pound a month into a Google AdWords campaign, for example. Putting that in the hands of someone who knows how that works will get you the best return rather than guessing yourself. Um, if you do want to look into it yourself, there's loads of YouTube videos that you can go and check out from various content creators who break it all down. It's not something we can cover in this video now because I'm not an AdWords expert, but it's just to make you aware of that. Okay, so once you've got your marketing pipeline set, so you've got your online presence, you've done your print adverts in the local magazines and such, you need to be monitoring all of that. And by that, I mean actually answering the phone. So the phone number you've put on the marketing, make sure that it's one that's monitored and someone's going to pick up and deal with the inquiries. Same with the email inbox or your web contact form, make sure that they're monitored and that you're getting back to people in a reasonable time frame. If you can, the quicker the better, but obviously whilst you're out on site doing work, it's not always possible to get back to people immediately, but at least the same business day, even if it's just to acknowledge the inquiry, say thanks for getting in touch with us, we've received your inquiry, I'll be back in touch with you soon to um, arrange a quotation or whatever. There is automated systems you can put in place to do that through the varying software packages that are out there, depending on who your web host is. So look out for those as well. You can have an email autoresponder to every inquiry. Again, use the experts if you're not sure how to do that. Otherwise it can end up quite ham-fisted and stuff doesn't work how it should and it just looks unprofessional. So make sure if you're not sure how to do it, and my advice would be don't do it. Just deal with it on a manual basis. But if you can set those automatic responses to things up, it really does give a feel of professionalism without you actually having to do anything. Um, so it's worth considering. Okay, so there is also the aspect of managing your clients as well. Now you could do that with pen and paper and a diary. That's how we used to do it in the past. There is lots of other solutions out there now that can help you from some of the well-established brands that You've probably all seen knocking around on social media from Tradeify and ServiceMate. So you could use one of those. It's just a way of recording your customer's details, estimating on their projects, any email communications that you would have with them, phone calls, they're all kind of logged in that one place. When you come to invoice them, you can link it up with your accountant's package. So if you're using Xero or Sage or something along those lines, it kind of all ties together to make things a little bit easier in terms of doing day-to-day -day administration. So there is that aspect. You could do it within an Excel spreadsheet if you wanted, but obviously there's lots of manual input and understanding how to set up and program spreadsheets. I'm not very good at stuff like that. Obviously we're a little bit more established now, coming up to 20 years in business. We've got quite a large client base. So we're currently using one of the CRM providers and it has freed up a ridiculous amount of time. It really has. And then again, <clears throat> when you're getting in touch with those Customers, it looks a little bit more professional as well in the way you're presenting yourself. That there's lots of templates that are all set out in the same way for quotations, for your invoices, for being able to track where engineers are on routes to the jobs, and also being able to log time that's been spent on those projects as well. So it's a really good way to be able to analyze data yourself, but provide good customer service as well to people who are buying your products and services. So that's something to consider. And in our unique industry, there is also the certification side of things. So when I first started out, it was pens and paper and pads of certificates you'd buy from your CPS provider that had already had the numbers allocated to them that you would manually sit and laboriously write out. You can tell I used to really enjoy it, especially big ICRs where you'd have pages and pages of test results. Or these days, you can use one of the software packages that are out there. There's lots of different options. The CPSs, so NAPIT and the NIC have their own certification suites. I'm using Modex Soft's Electrical OM now. If you're getting more into design and solar panels um, and things along those lines, then I would definitely look at Electrical OM as a base point. There is an investment there at the beginning, whereas some of the others are more a monthly based subscription model but it's worth it. It does cover off a lot more avenues as your business grows and develops. But if you're on a, a budget to start with, there's the generic forms that you can get out of the back of the regs books. You can download them as PDFs and fill them in in a PDF editor. There is some low cost solutions, but it involves 
more of your time completing them. So it's how you value your time at the initial outset of building your business. It could be that you've got the time to put into doing that. So it's no real hardship, but as things get busy and things grow, you need to look to make those jumps and changes quickly before you become swamped and overwhelmed with paperwork and administration, especially if you're a single person company. You don't want to spend your working week filling in paperwork and doing unproductive tasks when you could be out generating revenue from customers and clients. When there is software and other mechanisms out there that can help you do that without employing people. So keep on top of that as well. Now, whatever you're doing in terms of record keeping, so be that using CRM or a software package or Excel or pen and paper, whatever you're doing, you must analyze that data. So it's important you keep on top of that so you understand where your leads are coming from, from your marketing efforts. You know, if you're getting a load of leads from Instagram posts, for example, do more of them, put more of your focus into that area because it's bringing you results. If you're doing lots of print advertising that's costing you a thousand pound a month in local magazines but the phone's never ringing and no one's inquiring through them look at adjusting the advert repositioning it in where the magazine has advertising space it could be a, a tweak that's all that's needed or consider if it's actually worth that investment at all equally with your website if you're putting loads of time and effort into writing out hundreds of web pages but no one's ever hitting on them or viewing them you know, it's, is it productive effort in your business? Is it going to bring any rewards in the longer term? Don't discount things because they're not being productive at that particular moment. It could be that there's a, a lag in the time it takes for them to build up effect, especially with websites. It takes a while for them to rank, to be found, to get your message out there and having that base load of content ready, set and written. Whilst it might not seem valuable while you're running through that process because there's no one looking at it, you know, in the end, there may be a value there for that. So don't just dismiss something. Well, no one's looked at my website in a month. I'm not going to bother doing anything on there because that could be the wrong approach. But it is important that when you are getting those inquiries coming through, that you know where they've come from. So it does help you focus things a little bit better. And it's the same when you're analysing jobs as well. So if you're looking at um, a consumer unit replacement, for example, and you're kind of estimating it's going to take you a day, but you're finding out they're only taking you half a day or two days, that feedback of information can help you quote and plan better in the future. So information is one of the best resources that you have in your business. Utilize it and understand what it means. So as part of your data gathering and information recording, make sure you're asking for customer reviews. You can share that on your social media platforms, on your website, which is a great way to market yourself, but also it gives you some really valuable feedback on things you can improve maybe get better the next time, understand the stuff you're doing well and perhaps the stuff that's not going so well. You don't get better information than from those people who've used your services. So don't forget at the end of every job, send a request over for a review on, on Google or just a written review of your services that you can use on your website. However you want to do it, make sure you ask and collect that data. So one of the common mistakes lots of people starting out in business make is not marking up the materials they're purchasing. So just to put that out there that you are going to the trouble of collecting those materials, you're going to the trouble of sourcing them, it could be through research online or ringing around a wholesaler for a price, you always mark up what that is. It's not you ripping a client or customer off by charging more than what you paid for it, it's you adding your service charge onto that process and if you don't do that, sooner or later it will catch up with you. So there's your, your labour time you would charge out on site, whatever the overheads are on your business, and again, link into the video on the Mark the Sparky channel, which explains that a bit more. And marking up your material purchase is a big part of that, so don't forget to do it. So another thing you're gonna have to do as a business owner is build up relationships in the trade. Now that can be from wholesale accounts, so where you're taking account with a, a national chain or a local wholesaler that you've got that credit account facility if you want it to be able to help fund some of your projects whilst you get paid by your clients or even if it's a cash account so you get a discount on their standard sales prices because often you'll pay over the odds if you don't have an account of some sort to trade through them with. And also relationships with local contractors. It's a really valuable thing to put some time and effort into because sometimes They'll be busy and be able to offer you a bit of work if you're interested or pass on your details to an inquiry they've had if they're swamped themselves. Or equally, if you find yourself in that position, being able to help people out in, in the opposite direction, you know, builds that 
trust and network there that can really help you. We've got that in our local area where we do help each other out with inquiries. We will pass work between or certainly inquiries between other contractors based on our own availability. It's not dog eat dog out there and it's worth building those relationships with other people in your sector. Don't just put up the, the battle fences and start war with everyone in the local area. You can actually have a fruitful relationship with other contractors in your unique contracting space. They're not the enemy. So as I said at the start of the video, I have also made a video on my Mike the Spark YouTube channel around understanding what your costs are as a business or a sole trader so you can help figure out what that is and determine what your hourly rate needs to be, for example. Um, and again, that's just through my own experience. I'm not sharing this as a business guru. It's just what I've learned and the things that I do. I'm not necessarily saying that's what you should do. But sharing those experiences out there in the hope that it might help you form your business in the way you want to set up and it is different and unique for all of us. The aim of this video has just been to outline some of the core things that you need to get in place to help you start trading. Some of the hoops you have to jump through and hurdles you have to clear. It's not a step-by-step -step how to. It is actually um, a very exciting thing to be your own boss and run your own business and you know grow and develop it exactly how you want to but it's not without its challenges. So don't go into it blind thinking it's gonna be a uh, easy process of just start advertising and the phone starts ringing and the money starts rolling because that's generally not what happens. There will be lots of ups and downs of it. You've gotta be quite robust and prepared to deal with those challenges, be it um, a client that doesn't pay you or a large unexpected tax bill or a mistake you make. You have to be faced, ready to face those challenges head on and work through them because they will inevitably happen at some stage. And equally, whilst you would be dealing with those things, don't forget to deal with the many good things that will happen to you as well. So the successful projects that you will run, the growth in your business, the new employees, if you achieve a certain accreditation with an external organization, such as a CPS provider or whatever it may be, celebrate those things and give yourself a pat on the back as well. I hope this video has been to some help for those of you who are on that journey now into starting your own businesses or thinking about doing so. If you do have any questions, you can drop a message over in the comments or you can DM me and I'll try my very best to help out in any way that I can. And yeah, thank you for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you didn't enjoy it and I will see you on the next one.